this lecture, we return to the chronological narrative. We had uh, looked at the fall of Robespierre on 9th of Thermidor corresponding to 27th July of 1794. What followed is known as the period of Thermidorian reaction and then the rule of the directory leading to the coup d'etat of 18 Brumaire which brought the soldier of the revolution, Napoleon Bonaparte, to almost unbridled power in France. How did this come about? How one attempt at centralization of power by the Jacobins was followed by a return to the principles of 1789 and then led to another centralization that many of the revolutionaries did not quite bargain for. We try to understand how the revolution was brought to a close by the coup d'etat of 18th Brumaire. The fall of Robespierre was followed, as I said earlier, by the Thermidorian reaction. The name obviously derives from the month of Thermidor according to the new calendar and it was on the 9th of Thermidor that Robespierre, Couton and Saint-Just were arrested and glottened the next day. Thermidorian reaction has been described by one historian as not just the overthrow of a few persons but rejection of a system of government. Obviously that government was the dictatorial regime of the Jacobins or of Robespierre, if you please. But Thermidorians, it seemed, continued with the policy that they ostensibly uh, set out to reverse. Terror, sometimes referred to as the white terror of the Thermidorian, characterized the earlier terror of the Jacobins. Many men perished in the months that followed. What we see gradually is the disappearance of the revolutionary crowd from the streets of Paris. Let me dwell a little on this revolutionary crowd. From April 1789, the Réveillon riots to early 1794, they had been with the revolutionary bourgeois leadership. The Sarkulot crowd of Paris propelled the revolution onto the road of radicalism. They had broadened the social basis of the revolutionary government. They forced the bourgeois leadership to introduce a controlled economy, to accept the obligation of the state to support the poor and the indigent, but all this would now come to an end, it seemed. Who are these Sarkulot? The, the typical icon of a Sarkulot with this uh, red beret or the cap of liberty, the pike with the tricolor and the pantaloon, the loose kind of trousers that they wore. A Sarkulot literally meant without breeches. Uh, breeches were the marks of uh, aristocracy or, or at least of notability. These men were common people, shopkeepers, artisans, small rentiers, uh, by and large the common people of Paris and also uh, in the countryside in the, in the other urban areas. Now they did play a significant role. George Rude, an English historian, wrote a book on the crowd in the French Revolution. Now what he tried to uh, uh, find is the, the faces in the crowd. He tried to locate the faces and thanks to him and also the efforts of Richard Cobb who looked at it from a different angle altogether, we know about many men who actually uh, and, and women who actually participated in these journeys, etc. Now this revolutionary crowd of Paris returns to the scene for the last time in April and May 1795 when they took to the street shouting slogans and demanding bread and the constitution of 
1793, the constitution of the year 2 as they called it. That was the abortive Jacobin constitution. Then they disappear. Crowd is excluded from political action. They return to Paris in 1830 and 1848 during the two revolutions. In 1871 during the Paris Commune and finally some historians have argued in 1968 uh, when De Gaulle was brought down from power. But with their disappearance, the Thermidorians tried to consolidate their regime. The old uh, uh, moderate bourgeois leadership, those who would not have minded a constitutional monarchy but were happy with a moderate republic returned to power. They sought what Robespierre did in the last stages, neutralization of the power of the popular movement. They now set about the task of framing a constitution and in 1795 what came to be known as the constitution of the year 3 was accepted. This constitution gave the executive power to the directory. There would be five directors. Legislative power was now given to two chambers. The lower house would be the council of 500 with one third of the members retiring every year. And the upper house would be known as les, les Anshia or the elders. Franchise was once more restricted, only about 40,000 people constituted the pay uh, political, that is the political nation. The property owners republic, it appeared, would now be restored once more. How does one characterize the period of the directory? The directory followed what they called the politic, the bascule, a politics of balance. But what comes out is the uh, administrative ineptitude, the increasing corruption of the directory. And this did not allow them to concentrate on solving the problems which continued. There was a war going ab ab abroad and it is a war that demanded the attention of the directors. Tim Blanning has said that the Girondins now returned to power and I am to quote him, the Girondins now wanted to take the continent with a reckless abandon. The Girondins were also uh, uh, seeking to restore the politics of the possessing classes. This is what led to the gradual exclusion of the people. The, the war also meant that it was necessary to keep the army supplied and an increasing dependence of the directory on the army. Let us look at this very briefly. Currency uh, had all but disappeared. The directory tried to reintroduce the metal currency and it would, was made possible uh, because of certain conquests which were made during this period, particularly the invasion of Italy and the campaigns in Italy. Price was still continuing to rise. There was a persistence of a counter-revolutionary movement in certain parts of France, particularly in the Midi region. This had the st strange uh, nomenclature. It was called the Chouan Ri. Chouan actually uh, was the hooting of the owl. And these counter-revolutionaries who were dispersed would uh, simulate the hooting of an owl as a signal for congregation. There was the fear of radicalism as well. The elections which uh, came uh, increasingly uh, every year seemed to return both royalist deputies and Jacobin deputies in increasing number. So the directory at a level was always wedged between a royalist fear and the fear of the Jacobins. This at a level also limited the options of the directory and given their uh, nepotism and corruption and ineptitude, uh, it was unlikely that they would be able to deliver France out of the 
continuing chaos that the that, that, that people continued to experience. The war had certainly gone in favor of France as I said between 1795 and 98 France had uh, crossed the boundary and now the conquests were organized into associated republics in Holland, in Switzerland, in Italy these associate republics came up. Italy's uh, campaigns also as I noted earlier brought in a good uh, bit of uh, uh, plunder uh, to fill the coffers of, uh, uh, of France. Now the rise of Napoleon Bonaparte during the Italian campaign also brought the directory into a, some kind of a symbiotic relationship with him. They would increasingly depend on Napoleon and on the generals uh, uh, in, a, in a manner of speaking in order to sustain themselves in power. And this they did by executing what in a common parlance historians would refer to as coup d'etat. There was first of all the coup d'etat of Vendemier. Vendemier uh, that was uh, in 1795 when uh, there was a new law which uh, said that the, it was a royalist uprising uh, against uh, the uh, decision to allow the two thirds of the outgoing assembly to continue. Royalist sections of Paris tried to organize what was a disjointed kind of uprising and it was Napoleon Bonaparte who dispersed the crowd with a whip of grape shot as it was known. Napoleon had numerical inferiority but with clever generalship he outmaneuvered the royalist uprising. Then came uh, another coup d'etat in Fructidor. Now uh, Vendemier, Fructidor these are all new months in the revolutionary calendar. The coup d'etat of Fructidor that is September 1797 led to the annulment of the election of 177 deputies suspected of having royal sympathies. At the same time in 1796 radicalism reappeared in the person of Gracchus Babouf. Babouf was a minor Jacobin administrator and a militant revolutionary of the earlier period. He was disillusioned after the fall of Robespierre and did not quite like the way popular movement was sought to be neutralized even by him. Babouf wanted to stage another insurrection, another revolution if you please in order to capture power. He named it the conspiracy of equals. At a signal there would be insurrections in different parts of France and they would capture power. But this did not continue for a uh, long time. The directory get to know uh, about the conspiracy. It was uh, suppressed. Babouf and his associates were arrested and duly sent to the guillotine. Babouf to many in later generations appeared as a kind of a proto-communist or one of the early communists. But it indicated that radicalism was still thriving in France. Moreover, after 1797, Jacobin deputies seemed to be uh, returned in fairly large number to the council uh, of 500. The election of many of them including that of Abbe Gregoire had been set aside, but it did create discontent. At a level then the directory was unable to solve either the administrative or the uh, financial crisis. It did some good work, for example, the, at the front of food supplies. They kept the city supplied, they kept the army supplied, but the fall uh, of the value of ASEAN was disastrous indeed by now. And there was even a partial bankruptcy a few, few months before the directory was to fall. 
there was some improvement in trade. Protectionism was widely practiced uh, in order to encourage France's industries and there was some improvement in communications. But politically the directory failed to acquire roots and uh, with increasing number of hostile deputies being returned, directory felt very unsure of itself and increasingly were dependent on these generals. The generals were not uh, uh, very long to detect this dependence and indeed thought of using them. And the one, one gentleman who did was Napoleon Bonaparte as he was being solicited by the various factions amongst the politicians. A solution to the crisis it seemed could come if Napoleon could be utilized by the politicians. Now men like C.S. who had become a director were working in that direction. Napoleon after the uh, return from the Italian campaign was sent to the army of the west for a while but then at his own suggestion he was sent to Egypt. He returned from Egypt and a conspiracy for a coup d'etat had virtually been hatched during this time. C.S. and Ducos, two of the directors, they were party to this conspiracy and Baras, another director, uh, agreed to remain neutral. Talera mediated uh, in the hatching of the conspiracy between C.S. and Napoleon. The three directors resigned and the other two were arrested. Lucia Bonaparte, the brother of Napoleon Bonaparte was made the president of the Council of 500 and the appointed day came on 18th of Brumaire 1799. Brumaire is also the name of a month according to the new revolutionary calendar. The meeting was shifted from Paris to Saint-Cloud, the palace of Saint-Cloud because of a suspected Jacobin uprising in Paris. Napoleon on 18th Brumaire surrounded the council house with about four or five thousand soldiers. His brother was inside. Napoleon then raided the assembly chamber with uh, his guards. Lots of members objected to this. They rushed towards him shouting slogans. It was at this point that Lucia Bonaparte came out of the chamber, called in the guards and the soldiers forcibly ejected the members. The coup d'etat of 18th Brumaire was carried out. Executive authority was now entrusted to a three-member consulate. Napoleon was to be the first consul only. C.S. and Duco would be other consuls. C.S. had put forward his theory of constituent sovereignty long time back. He now proposed a new constitution on the basis of authority from above and confidence from below. But it seemed, as Markham has said, there were not one coup but two coup d'etat on 18th Brumaire 1799. One that was devised by the politicians, where they thought of using Napoleon in order to come to power. But the second was executed by the Napoleon, where he turned the tables on the direct, uh, politicians of the directory and arrogated all power to himself. In 1799, he was the first consul. The constitution was duly adopted of the year 7. In 1802, he made himself the consul for life and a new constitution was made, that of year 10. And then in 1804, he made himself the emperor of France and a new constitution, again that of year 12. All these constitutions were overwhelmingly endorsed by the people of France. So on 18 Brunel 1799, all power passed to the hands of a 30-year-old general who was to control the destiny not only of France but virtually the whole of Europe for the next decade and a half. How did Napoleon rise to power? The first great moment of Napoleon's rise came during the siege of Toulon. We had noted this earlier. When he succeeded in relieving the siege of Toulon, Napoleon right through played a role that was out of proportion to his rank. After this, he was raised 
to the position of brigadier general. Then he saved the directory during the insurrection of the Vaudemir and Napoleon was now raised to the rank of a major general. The second great moment of his uh, rise to power came during the campaigns in Italy. In 1796, Napoleon was given charge of the campaign of Italy. To the contemporaries, his Italian campaign was nothing short of the miraculous. Twelve victories in as many months, he had introduced a new blitzkrieg. France and the French forces swooped down from the Alps on Italy like an avalanche, carrying everything before them. It was a new generalship. It was a new strategy, a new tactic. In short, a new kind of military maneuvering that Napoleon had introduced. And the success was attributed to the genius of the leader. After this, Napoleon did not uh, really turn back. Napoleon also did take steps to attach the army personally to him. He paid them in hard cash rather than in inflated currency notes. And he earned the gratitude and loyalty of the soldiers that lasted beyond his fall and turned him into a legend. A third point was that Napoleon was using political power independently of the directory. In the, during the Italian campaign, the way the conquered territories would be reorganized and also the final treaty that was signed with or, Austria or the preliminaries that he signed at Leoben were all done without any reference to the directory. And in this way, Napoleon was testing the ground and very successfully did this. We have seen earlier that during the Fructidor also, the directory was dependent on him and he had bailed them out. The final factor that uh, helped Napoleon's rise to power was the weakness of the directory. There had increasingly been a degree of restlessness in France as the directory was failing to bring it to a close. And as Lefebvre has said, it was necessary to close the revolution, but how to do it? How would the gains of the revolution be preserved? The directory was inept and corrupt. Economic crisis was continuing. French coffers were virtually empty. The war could have gone against the uh, French any day uh, had Napoleon not been there. Now in this, and, and there was the royalist threat, there was the Jacobin threat. How in order, how, how in short, to come out, this, out of this multifaceted crisis and save what remained of the revolution, at least the moderate goals of 1789. For these were reintroduced by the constitution of 1795. As Lefebvre had said, indeed, it was an inner necessity that drove the revolution to dictatorship and not for the first time. He was obviously referring to the Jacobin dictatorship. When just before Napoleon uh, uh, captured power on his return from Egypt, he had said, I am quoting what he told a friend, quote, in what sort of state did I leave France and in what sort of state do I find it again? I left you peace, I find war. I left you conquests and the enemy is crossing our frontier. I left you our arsenals full, I do not find a single weapon. I left you the millions of Italy and I find spoliating laws and poverty everywhere." Unquote. So it was this inner necessity that really drove Napoleon, uh, that drove the revolution to find a strong man and a strong government. The, the Jacobins earlier, as Lefebvre puts it, wanted a democratic dictatorship. But the men of 1789, who now sought what bourgeois calls, uh, what Lefebvre calls a bourgeois dictatorship. They could address themselves only to the army, excluding the people as they did. When they found themselves under an entirely different dicta dictatorship, it was too late and resistance was at almost impossible. It was now widely believed that Napoleon 
could be the savior. Napoleon could save France from both the royalist threat, the invasion from Europe and the Jacobin danger. He in short became the bulwark of the society. Tocqueville had long time back said that there were two ways in which the revolution could be brought to a close. A through personal interest, B through national glory and as he commented neither led to liberty but both to Napoleon Bonaparte. What is the significance of Napoleon's rise to power? The significance in other words of the 18th Brumaire. Jean Toulard, a recent historian has said that faced with internal and external danger, the French bourgeoisie always succeeded in inventing a savior. In his book, The Myth of the Savior, he suggests that Napoleon was a savior that the bourgeoisie had invented to protect themselves against the two-pronged internal and external danger. Napoleon, he said, opened the way for many others. There were uh, men like Cavenac, his own nephew, Louis Napoleon, Pétain, even de Gaulle in the 20th century. Now, as I am quoting from Tular, quote, and because the bourgeois principal virtue is ingratitude and its major defect, lack of courage, the separation of the savior from his inventors has more often than not come through in a national catastrophe. Usually, the savior bears the responsibility. The savior appears out of tragic circumstances, a coup, a revolution, or a national defeat. He disappears in an apocalyptic atmosphere. In all this can be seen the consequences of the disappearance of the principle of legitimacy on which the old monarchy was based before 1789. Napoleon is the archetype of these saviors who are landmarks in the history of 19th and 20th century France." Unquote. Why did they want to do this? The sale of the bien nationaux, the confiscated property, had benefited a section of the peasantry and the bourgeoisie. Many in the upper and middle levels of the bourgeoisie had benefited from the revolution by through speculation, by indulging in trade through the purchase of land and they now wanted the revolution to be brought to a successful conclusion. It was an alliance of the bourgeoisie and a part of the peasantry. They could now have this done around one man and around one principle. The principle was already known, that of property. The man was now found, Napoleon Bonaparte. <laughs>